Suffering and death are a common lot to every one of us. A great many people rose this morning to live a day without any thought of leaving this world. And yet they will be gone before the day is over. Others went to bed last night thinking this, that, and the other that they would do today. And they did not because they died. Tomorrow, Monday, if it should come, there will be folks go to the doctor and they'll have tests done and this, that, and the other. They'll have certain complaints and something's been bothering them for a good while that has been abnormal from what normally is a lot of mankind. And sometime later on, it'll be reported to them that you have inoperable cancer or you'll have some other kind of terrible disease because this life is not meant to go on and on and on. A great many young people will think they have time and this time tomorrow they will be in eternity. But while we're living here, People suffer, and people die for various reasons at different ages. In the days of the judges of Israel, Israel was invaded by the Midianites, Judges chapter 6. For seven years, they occupied the land. In doing so, they destroyed the crops and they destroyed Israel's livestock. People were in such dire straits that they lived in caves to try to escape, to be able to eke out an existence. So they were suffering. God declared to Gideon through an angel in Judges 6, verse 12, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Well, Gideon saw all of this. He was experiencing it. He was seeing what was happening. And in verse 13, listen to this. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all of this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Verse 13. Today I don't see people any different than that, even many in the church. They approach it from this angle. If there is a God, why this, that, or the other? Why cancer? Why did the baby die? I remember that coming home vividly to me when I was in college and a person who was in the class behind me at my high school was living a rather wild life, rounded a curve going too fast as wrapped himself around a tree and killed himself. And I remember, because his family was known to my family, we went to the funeral home. And his grandfather was sitting there by the casket. And he was lamenting the situation, and one of the things that fell from his lips was this. Why him? I've lived my life. Why couldn't it have been me? I wonder how many times that's been uttered or at least thought of concerning a child or a wife or brother or sister or husband. A person, as I said, undergoes a stroke, is paralyzed or in some sort of horrible accident, is paralyzed and all sorts of other things 
diseases that inflict people. You can just think of them and probably think of different people you know in your family or friends or others that have undergone all that kind of thing. Now, is there an answer? Well, there is, and we want to pose the question, what is the answer? Because, you see, this has been around for a long time, and I cite Judges 6 and verse 13 to show that even though God called Gideon a mighty man of valor, he couldn't understand why all of this suffering. So, first of all, we have to ask the question, what's the problem? What's the problem? Because many times there are those, and plenty of them in a secular world, who've concluded there is no deity whatsoever. And they've concluded that because they cannot subject, listen to me, they cannot subject all human suffering, human suffering, to the meaningful, to meaningful examination. They assume, and underscore that word assume, therefore, that God does not exist or these things would not happen. If you'll notice that most people's problems, whether they're atheists or whether they're agnostics or materialists of some sort, they are trying to make everything fit into this present world in time and space and material things and life of the flesh on earth. They're trying to think from that perspective. They don't think beyond that. This is where they are. This is all they've experienced. And everybody else around them are in the same boat. And so what they're really saying is it must be all taken care of now in the present in time and space. Now this view I've just uttered if you look back to Epicurus, 342 B.C. to 270, you'll see where that was formulated into an argument. He said, if God wishes to prevent evil but cannot, then he's not all powerful. If he can prevent evil but will not, then he's not good. If he has both the power and the will to eliminate evil, then why is evil in the world? Now, these are supposed to be some great philosophers, that is, great thinkers. But there's some things he certainly missed. The error in the basic premise to this argument is the assumption that there is no purpose served by God allowing evil and suffering in the world. I said earlier, people see things only in the flesh and in time and space. They don't allow for things to keep going on after this life and this old system is over with. They don't understand. We tend to be that way too much. Even in the church, we tend, because that's all we've ever experienced, we tend to t uh, trust in our experience and in our associations and our understanding of things regarding this life. We don't realize that this life only is for a while. As James says, it's a vapor and it appears for a little while, then vanishes away. And the whole system, the whole physical system, is going to end someday. Nothing will be then like it is now, except we will still exist. Each one of us is our own center of personality. We won't cease to exist. Anybody born into this world will never cease to exist. Now, the ones in heaven have eternal life. The ones in hell have eternal death. We should not call people who are in hell alive. It shows our limited understanding of life. When you have eternal life, that's focusing on the quality of that existence. When you have eternal death, you're seeing the consequences 
of total, complete, and absolute and forever separation from God or anything having to do with him. It's not life. Now, I don't claim to understand completely everything about the subject with which I'm dealing. There's a lot of things like that. But I have enough revealed from my God to give me the insights I need. And what is not revealed, we must remember, remains in the counsels of God. Paul declared Romans eleven thirty three. Oh, the depth and the riches both of wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Moses in the Old Testament said the secret things belong unto the Lord, our God. But those things which are revealed belonging to us and our children forever. Here's why, that we may do all the words of this law, Deuteronomy 29, 29. Thus we have the scriptures to lead, guide, and direct us, and they're sufficient for what they were given to accomplish, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, 1 Peter or 2 Peter 1 and 3. What I'm saying simply is enough is revealed so that we may have a sufficient answer to our subject, to our question. So let's see if we can't, from what is revealed in our own proper thinking with that information, solve the problem. First of all, the question of evil. You ever used the word evil? That's none of those little words that uh, you try to explain it. We use it sometimes and yet we can't explain it. The question of evil implies, it implies some sort of objective standard of right and wrong that has been transgressed. In other words, where does evil come from? Well, you say it comes from the devil. No, that's not what I mean. How is evil in this world? If there wasn't a standard of right and wrong, there couldn't be any evil. Sin is the transgression of God's law, 1 John 3 and verse 4. Without God's revelation of how he wants man to live, there would be nothing to transgress and thus there would be no evil. So if there's no God, I simply ask where did that standard come from? You can say, well, men just got together and formulated how people are to live. What men? Who has a right to do that? Of course, if you follow that reasoning to its ultimate conclusion, then it makes every civil government over that given country the one to set up all ethical and religious standards of right and wrong. And they could be, therefore, very right in the United States, but over in China, completely wrong. But as they said at the Nuremberg trials and trying the Nazis when they tried to make that kind of case, they said there's a higher law. And they meant there's God from whom all law comes. He doesn't just arbitrarily say, I'm going to pick these laws and reveal them. They flow from the very nature of God, whose nature flows from the essence of deity. And thus, that's why man, regardless of how pagan he is, comes up with some kind of laws to live by. Why should dead rocks and dirt that's evolved over billions of years and accidentally turned into who we are have any concept of law? You wouldn't. Many other things are like that. So how could there be such a thing as evil? If there is no God, there wouldn't be. There would not be a universal code of ethics. It's just that way. What they did in China might be wholesome and good, and what we do here would be wrong, and vice versa, and any other country you went into, because it would be all left up to men. And then you've got to ask the question, well, why did men even come up with the idea of a standard whereby we live, whether it's civil law, criminal law, or religious law? Why? 
You go to the most pagan of societies that have no knowledge of Jehovah God, no knowledge of the Bible at all, and they'll have some rules and regulations concerning land ownership or marriage, no matter how far it is from what the Bible teaches, they'll have it. Why do they do that? Because they have a spirit made in the image of God, and it naturally, if you want to call it that, seeks to do those things. We must examine the nature of God and man to get at our subject of suffering and death on this earth and why such a thing happens. You remember John said in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8 that God is love. Now I've spoken on this many, many times over the years and here especially. Man abuses that word love and misuses it and makes it say things it never did. And you know in the Greek language they had four words for love. When he says God is love here, he uses the highest form of the word love. And that's agape. Years ago I, I was speaking about the abuses of this love. Now I don't know why it came to mind at that time. But I said I've heard agape so much I could agape. And I didn't mean by that I rejected the truth of God on it. That's marvelous. Highest form of love is discussed by the inspired Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. But I meant the, the, the corruption that people have placed on it. It's basically a sick sentimentalism and syrupy, subjective thing that changes according to how men feel. That's not agape love. The highest form of love is one that wills the best for you and you will the best for me, the best being acceptable to God, being a godly person. It is a love that can be commanded. Jesus said, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. American Standard Version 1901, John 14, 15. The other loves have more of an emotional attachment. They surge and wane according to various things that happen to people, the mood a person's in or whatever. Agape love is the stabilizing love that always seeks the truth of God and views everything through the truth of God. It's one reason you have Jesus saying, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. It's objective, and it's absolute, and it's humanly attainable. You can know that you know what God's will is for your life and everybody else's. You can know the standard of God. So the creation of man in reality is a manifestation of God's love. And how he created man is a manifestation of his love. He created us free moral agents. You're here because you chose to be. A lot of people today and right now who chose to be a lot of other places. But God gave you the power to come here today or not come here today. And so it is with mankind. Well, why, why did God make us such a way we could sin and then be lost? Because he loved us. He wants people to choose to love him. Let me ask you something about your own children. Don't you want them to choose to love you? Would you have them just like some robot doing what you tell them without any desire at all involved to please you? Well, let's say you don't have children, even though you are one. What about the love of your husband for you and the love you have for your husband? Don't you want them to freely choose to love you? Think of the vows. I guess they still have them in some marriages. And what those vows actually say. They're saying you're making a choice. By your free will, you're choosing to have this relationship with this man and this woman. 
And we used to call it the bonds of holy matrimony because God ordained marriage in the home. God has the final say on who can marry and what marriage is and what a home is and the role of a man and a husband and a father and a woman and a wife and a mother and a child. He's the one that did all of that. Marriage in the home was created for the benefit of you and me if we will but follow what he teaches about it. So God gave us free will. And when he gave us free will, Genesis 2, 16 and 17, or Joshua 24, 15, and so many other places, that evidence is that man can choose to do good, as the Bible defines the good, or evil, that which is contrary to the will of God in the Bible. Now, because we have free will, we are human beings and therefore finite, which means limited, we have freedom of choice. Man makes wrong choices many times. When wrong choices are made, and get this point, when wrong choices are made, consequences are suffered. I used to, they'd call that the school of hard knocks. On old country show Hee Haw years ago, a fella would say, where you been? The other one would respond by saying, well, I'm in the hospital. And I'll say, well, what were you in the hospital for? I broke my leg in three places. And the response was, you ought to stay out of those places. What's the idea? The idea is you don't learn from the school of hard knocks, or maybe you should. So when wrong choices are made, consequences are suffered. One of the most true tremendous wrongs in our government today and in the home today. Wrong choices were made and consequences are very, very slow in coming if they ever come. And what does that do to people? Well, it's not hard to see. Children in a home, just warn them and warn them and warn them but never follow through in correcting them. You think they're going to believe you when you tell them, well, I'm going to give you a spanking after about five years. You said you're going to spank them. Are you going to make them stand in the corner? Are there going to be something to punish them for the wrong they did? But you never do. Now, when they grow up under that situation, how do you think they're going to think about everything else? That's the way they've been molded. That's what your home is to do is to train them and to teach them. Set a godly example for them and to teach this point that when you do wrong, you must accept that you did the wrong. You made a choice that was bad, now you must suffer for it. If you'll look at modern day psychology and sociology and the matters that pertain to criminology nowadays, you'll see that everything focuses on rehabilitation. Well, I have no problem trying to discern between certain people who can still be changed and certain who are, as they call them, hardened criminals. But they've almost ruled out you're where you are because you are being punished for the wrong you did and there are consequences to your actions. It's just not taught that way. And you look round about you and you don't have to look too far. And you see what's going on in our society. When a president, I don't care what party or no party, can stand up and talk about illegal, and that's a bad thing to say, and his own party didn't like it because he said illegal, he should have said undocumented. Well, what does that mean? Illegal means you're in violation of the law. And people who violate the law ought to be punished. Well, this bring that over to our whole society, to the way children are dealt with in the home. And there'll be a whole lot more people coming across the border and the borders of every description because there's no teeth in the thing. There's no consequences. And so you say, well, what's the difference in me striving to be what the law says, whether it's civil law or any other law, 
We're not. I watched a thing on television the other day, and I'm making that application to what's current in our minds now, but it affects all of society, as I've been trying to say. And they were pointing out that there are people who are trying to abide by the law and being a legal immigrant coming to this country. And they picked out one fellow who's been waiting 25 years, I believe 28 years, going through the legal system to try to come here legally. He ain't got here yet. Now, let me ask you something the way people think. Why should he do that when he can walk to the border and walk across? Okay, you're thinking that way. Are you with me? Bring it down to the home, to the school, to federal, state, and local government, to about anything. What in the world are rules and regulations for? And when it comes to God dealing with man, the Creator has a right to control His creation. And He has laws. And we must respect them. Well, in going further with this, now that we've got that, I hope, in our minds, that one of the ways we learn right from wrong is the school of hard knocks. I want us to note some different types of suffering in the world. First of all, there are individual personal wrong choices. Regarding Israel of old and the Midianites, we learned that the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years, Judges 6.1. Now Gideon should have understood that. But he's just as human as you are and I am. The Apostle Peter in the New Testament taught this. Speaking to Christians. Let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer. And that covers a multitude of things. Or as a meddler in other men's matters. You may be suffering... But don't suffer for these things. That's why he's going to say, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. What he lists here, you ought to be ashamed of wearing the name of Christ if you're going to be caught up as a murderer, thief, evildoer, or a meddler in other men's matters, or any other thing. You can look over in Galatians 5 and see the works of the flesh that you would be doing while wearing the name Christian, a member of the Lord's church, having obeyed the gospel to become such. But he says, if you're suffering because you obey God, that's a different story. You glorify God to be able to do that. Remember, Christ suffered because he did what his father wanted him to do. So they're the personal wrong choices. We suffer for those things. But then there are personal wrong choices of other people. Innocent people. This will happen today somewhere in this country, I'm quite sure. Innocent people can be killed in a car wreck by a drunk driver. No fault of their own. Because we live in a world where people can exercise their free will and they can choose to do good or bad. And the innocent can suffer from that. And they do. It happens every day. We sometimes pay a very high price for others' freedom of choice. God was willing to do that when he made this world as it is. There are personal wrong choices. We don't think about this one very much. Of past generations. They still affect us today. God declared that the rejection of him would affect later generations of Israel in Exodus chapter 20 verses 5 and 6. One of the big problems that's kept India as what we call a third world country today is because of the Hindu religion and what it teaches. You have people starving. And there's a cow standing there they could eat and they won't do it. Because they think they're going to eat their grandmother or something like that because of what the matter of the Hindu religion teaches. You've had trouble all over the world in my lifetime. Well, just immediately preceding it, World War II, the Korean War, and all these wars in between time. Now what's going on over now in the 
Israel and Gaza, Ukraine and so forth. Now, if you look back on all that, things that happened a long, long time ago brought that on. So you have all those things, personal wrong choices of past generations. Now, a lot of people don't want to think this way, but viruses and germs that cause diseases, none of that was in the Garden of Eden. They could eat the tree of life and whatever it did meant as long as they could stay there and eat that, they'd live forever. But when Adam and Eve sinned and they were cut off from the tree of life, Genesis 3, 22 and 23, they suffered the consequences. And as you read down through your Old Testament, as the years went by and men got further and further away from the tree of life, their years shortened and their years shortened. And who knows what all kinds of germs that cause all kinds of diseases came into existence. People talk about genetic problems today, and they're real. We're learning more and more that a whole lot of what's wrong with people is caught up in their genes. Well, how did all that change? Sin impacted this whole world, folks. The world before the flood, and the flood was brought in because of wicked men, the world before the flood is totally different from what the world is now. That didn't mean people weren't dying. That happened from the time that men sinned. They were separated immediately from God and then began to die physically. But the world after the flood allows for and it's set up of all kinds of natural disasters. In other words, the world bears the consequences of sin. List what we have in Romans 8.22. And this is something Paul is very plain about. He says, for we know. No if, ands, or buts about it. For we know, listen, that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. What does he mean by that? The consequences of sin went further than just mankind. It corrupted the whole world. And eventually man persisting in sin caused the whole world to be changed in the flood so that what exists after that flood is not exi they not exist before the flood. But why the flood? Because man sinned, Genesis 6 through 8. Thus, the very creation of the environment that allows for floods and tornadoes and hurricanes and earthquakes and volcanic eruptions and such like things did not exist before the flood. But it exists now and has since the flood. Natural laws, their violation and their consequences. I mentioned in class this morning we studied Isaiah. If you've got a five-story building, a little baby is let loose, nobody watching it, which is pretty common nowadays, and it falls off that building, it violates the law of gravity. It'll suffer the consequences. Just like the person who goes up on top of that and deliberately goes up there to jump off and kill himself. Innocent baby is not going to fall off that building. He just float down to the ground. Same thing's true when it comes to electricity. An innocent baby might stick a wire in an outlet. It's going to shock him. An experienced electrician makes a mistake. He's going to be shocked too. So you have then the collapse of the tower in Siloam mentioned in Luke 13, verses 4 and 5. The Lord mentioned that. He says 18 men were killed. Those killed were no greater sinners than those not killed. Because the Jews had a way of saying, well, if a person's sin uh, in trouble he, he must have sinned not necessarily so not necessarily so we benefit from laws of nature i promise you i like it when i know i can step out of this building and not float off in outer space they're for our good would you transgress them and see what happens 
then we need to understand that suffering can benefit. If you ever ask yourself the question, I don't like pain, not one little bit. But what if you couldn't feel pain? My grandfather back in the 30s before there was all sorts of, of uh, antibiotics had pneumonia and he got over the pneumonia but it left uh, abscesses on, I think it was his left lung. And the VA hospital at that time was in Hot Springs, Arkansas and they took him up there because he'd been in the Navy in World War I. And they did surgery on him, and remember, there's no antibiotics. And they had to take all these ribs off, remove that lung, and they kept it packed for I don't know how long because it had to heal from the inside out. And after it healed completely, he had no feeling back here at all. And because he had no ribs, he had to wear a band of cloth about so wide enough to go around him and pinned up with safety pins. Every once in a while, he'd pin himself the safety pin and wouldn't even know it. So my grandmother would always put that on to make sure the safety pins went where they belonged. Seems to me pain would have been uh, pretty beneficial when it comes to that. Pain indicates a problem. Doctors may ask you, where do you hurt? <laughs> if there's no indicator, what would we do? Is the water too cold or especially is the water too hot? When people have neuropathy because of diabetes or some other reason, they have to be very careful because they can scald themselves and not even know it. So, Things we say are bad, like pain, not necessarily so. There's all sorts of reasons that we can benefit from suffering. The first thing is to understand what I started out with. We need to stop thinking of living on this earth as if this is the only place we're going to be. The Bible plainly tells us, using the prophet's terms, eternity is our long home. We go there, that's where we're going to be. That this is just a passing thing. James says, our life in the flesh on earth appears like a vapor just for a little while, then it vanishes away. So fragile and fleeting, and we don't know when it's going to end. Any one of us, before we leave this area, could be dead. There will be a lot of people who will. They'll never leave this area and a lot of other places. It make a difference how old or young you are, how innocent you are. Remember what we said about some drunk running over an innocent person? That happens all the time. Look at the little children reported every week that some immoral character has killed or hurt. Not the child's fault. So all those things happen. So the Bible gives emphasis to this place as a place of preparation for eternity. I've used this. You've heard me. Those who've heard me preach know that I've used it many times. It's not original with me. I heard it first from Brother Thomas B. Warren, the late Brother Thomas B. Warren, when he said, this life, meaning this life in the flesh on this earth, this life is perfect for what God intended it to accomplish. It's perfect in the sense of complete for getting you ready for eternity. And the quicker we learn that, the better we'll view life and see what's in it and understand what's going on. Most of us don't. We want all things solved as it fits time, space, and fleshly things. But it won't be. We'll be out of this world before you know it. I don't care how young you are, how old you are, how healthy you are or not. It's all going by very rapidly. Then what? It's like the old song goes, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. But that's all part and parcel. And after all, 
we've all sinned, and sin is the transgression of the law, and sin is the only thing that separates us from God. And God said, I've got a remedy. And Jesus came and solved the sin problem. For he was tempted in every point like as we are, yet without sin. So he could go to the cross and die on our behalf, not deserving death, but dying on our behalf. And we, through faith in him and compliance with his terms of pardon and the plan of salvation, in believing in him, repenting of our sins, confessing our faith in him, and being baptized into Christ and living a faithful life in the church to which he adds us, we have heaven as our home. Why can't we believe that? And why can't we let that cause us to view this life? A veil of tears, a veil of trial, a place where we're on probation before God. Will we follow him on the basis of the adequate evidence and credible witnesses that proves that God exists and that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God, the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by him? Why can't we believe that the gospel is God's power to save us, Romans 1.16? What else have you got? What man can you trust in or group of humans? Can you trust in the federal government? Well, look what it's doing even among our own nation. And look at all the other governments. How many governments have arisen and have fallen just since World War II? Well, what can they do? They can't even handle themselves. But God can't. But he says, prove to me you love me. And that you'll walk by faith and not by sight, 2 Corinthians 5, 7. And that your faith, your confidence, your trust will be such that you'll obey me and live faithful to me. That's why the judgment's pictured as the Lord saying to the saved, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter ye into the joys of thy Lord. Don't expect heaven here. Expect a state of probation and the way to live for the Lord so you can prove to him you love him. It's common sense. We do that in a lot of things. You prove to your employer that you are what you ought to be by doing a good job, being qualified, and so on down the line. Thus, let's hear the conclusion of the whole matter to hear the writer of Ecclesiastes. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it because you don't have any assurance you'll even leave this building today. And if you haven't obeyed that gospel, you stand before him separated and lost in your sins. And yet Jesus is still saying, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. If you're a child of God and sinned, you need to repent of those sins, confess them, and pray God for forgiveness. Thus, if you're subject to the Lord's blessed call, we invite you to come while we stand, while we sing.